So hello everybody, hello to all of those who just joined us. We are delighted to welcome you here today, to welcome you for, into this webinar, and we are going to talk about embracing change. But before we start, I'm going to give you two figures about the Segos Group, 50 and 4,500. They are, 50 is the number of, of uh, operating countries in which the Segos Group operates. We operate either through our subsidiaries or through a network of international, well-recognized and well-established partners. And 4,500 is the number of training experts, either SEGOS colleagues or external people that we rely on to deliver our trainings worldwide. And you have here a few other figures that gives you some insights as to the size of the SEGOS group and the training we deliver. The Segos Group supports companies with three, in three areas, with their international training projects, with design, we deliver and we help manage projects throughout the world. Turnkey training portfolio. We have a corporate learning collection of ready-to-go training solutions in different formats. And we can also help you companies create and implement a corporate training portfolio and outsourcing and learning services. We support and help companies with the administration of their learning services, with managing like, uh, like all their learning activities. Segos is a well-recognized and established expert in a variety of fields. And you have here a list of them. And today, we are going to look at two of them in more details, leadership and personal management, personal development, sorry. So, Christelle and Sarah, our speakers, and we are very lucky to have them here today, will talk, will deliver the webinar for you. Sarah Radcliffe is learning ambassador at Segos UK. Not only is she an expert on fostering a growth mindset, furthermore, she has a strong expertise in implementing change management within organizations. And Christelle Delavo, author and expertise manager at Segos France in personal development field. And she's also our director of the Sego School of Coaching. She will be sharing her expertise on developing personal and leadership skills to help individuals and teams navigate change more effectively. Our agenda today is in three parts. We're going to start by talking about the change challenges, then key power skills to develop. And then Christelle and Sarah are going to share some actionable techniques and resources that you will be able to take with you. We're going to finish with a Q&A session. So if you have any questions or any comments you would like to share, please do so in the chat and Christelle and Sarah will look at them and answer at the end of the webinar. This webinar is recorded. You will receive automatically the replay a few hours after the webinar. And the presentation will also be shared. It will be available for download within the WebEQ platform, which we are using today. Uh, if you have any issue with like the sound or the image, please do call the number that Marie shared a little earlier on in the chat. And without much further ado, let's start. Christelle, uh, no, sorry, Sarah, I hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. And welcome everyone to today's webinar. As Valerie has said, we're going to be really talking about embracing change and why it is so important. Well, what we absolutely know is that change is everywhere. Change is continually around us. We don't know really what's coming tomorrow. We don't know what's happening in the world, in the world economics, in technology. But what we do know is that the world keeps changing. And in line with that, we have to consider the impact of this on the workforce, on the people and our colleagues that are working around us. How well equipped are they to really not only be able to move with change, but to be able to really embrace change? And in actual fact, Christelle's got some figures for us to show us just how well the world does cope with change. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. So 
Yeah, two figures very interesting we wanted to share with you. First of all, 70% uh, of change programs fail to achieve their goals, which is quite significant. And second figure is 38% of employees are willing to support organizational change in 2020 when there were 74% in 2016. So what happened? That's a real shift, you know, concerning salaries and teams concerning change. The first one is a source of McKinsey and the second one is a Gartner source for your, your information. And so let's really kind of dive into this and think about how does change impact us? So we've done a little poll now, which will be coming up in the sidebar here. And we want to know how you feel. How does it make you feel when everything goes wrong or your plans suddenly get derailed? And whilst you're doing that, Christelle and I will have a little look at what's coming through the answers. So there in the polling on the sidebar, you will be able to answer how you're feeling. Maybe you feel shocked. Maybe it's frustrated. Maybe you've been through so much change that actually it doesn't phase you at all. Think about your personal scenarios and we'll have a look at what's coming through. Yeah, there's some big numbers here, Christelle, for frustrated. Uh, what I would say is that for me personally, when my plans are suddenly derailed and I'd set everything up as I wanted it and it goes wrong or is derailed, I certainly feel very frustrated. It's a really strong emotion for me. And um, what about you, Christelle? What do you, what's your go-to reaction here? Yeah, maybe I feel, you know, Sarah, it's a little bit unfair because, you know, at that point, everything was running so well, you know, so far. <laughs> so why, why did it change? I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. what's going wrong? How, how, yeah. how, dare, how dare the world conspire yeah. us? Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? If we look at these, some people are saying that they feel lost. Some people are going to shock. Some people are feeling anger, which is quite a strong emotion. Um, we've got a surprise in there and a small percentage. So just 6% of you are saying that you feel enthusiastic. Now, I'm going to hazard a guess that those of you that are feeling quite enthusiastic about it have perhaps undergone a lot of change because this all links to um, the paradox of change. And for some of you, you may well have seen the Kubler-Roche change curve. So you will understand that we go through this curve of emotions. And so emotions was quite strong on the poll because that's what hits us first. We, we can feel shocked. We can feel anger, fear. We can go into denial, pretend it's not even really happening. We can even sink down really low. And in, in some cases, that that real low level of the curve can last for quite some time because what we're trying to get to is that feeling of acceptance and ultimately trying to move out through the change curve so that we can really start to look at where the opportunities are. So the reality is that emotions are triggered. If you've been through change many times, your experience will mean that you go through this quicker. And this all links into neuroscience, which we're going to touch on briefly today. But ultimately, it's about learning strategies that enable you to move through the change curve really quickly. And we're going to be coming with you today with the skills and the tools to enable you to do that. But Christelle, what about the human element? What about the human side of this? Yeah, there is a real paradox, you know, Sarah, because on one hand, we see that it's a sort of processus when dealing with change. It means there are some resistance, emotions, thinking around all that. And at the same time, you know, on the other hand, we can bring another light and the way we look to change. So that's so, so interesting because humans are made to adapt. That's maybe a disclaimer today. <laughs> so our lives, you know, are made up of changes, right? Uh, that's a hallmark of human growth. Uh, 
I mean, we are first a baby, after a teenager, then an adult, and just have a look at all the events, evolution we are going through so quickly at this time. So yes, definitely, you go, we go through resistance, you know, but at the same time, I think we have the skills, we're going to speak about that, skills uh, which help us to cope with change. And speaking about neuroscience, as you said, Sarah, uh, that's exposure to new situation that really enable us to, you know, go further, uh, grow and learn. And second thing is neuroplasticity, because our brain builds uh, and deconstructs itself each day. So it's creating new neuronal connection and forgetting all of us as we go along. So nothing is li in life is permanent in a way. So I don't know if you feel this paradigm shift now, Sarah. <laughs> well, I definitely do. And there's a great saying, isn't there, saying that youth is wasted on the young. And that's because we learn through experience. But in a world which is changing so much, we need to really consider how we can enable our people in the workforce to adapt more quickly to change. And we're going to look at this today. So we're going to look at how we can turn um, challenges into opportunities, how we can change our mindset. And we're going to start with five simple steps that we can all use to cope with these changes. And what I would say is that we look at this from an organizational level, we look at it from a leadership level, and we're also going to look at it from those individual levels. Because like with the, the change curve, leaders and organizations will be familiar but perhaps not all individuals are. So Christelle, are you going to kick us off with the first of the five steps? Yeah, the five steps navigating change with success. And I think it's like, you know, Sarah, a top level athlete, you know, facing a new competition and a new challenge, he needs to prepare himself with this new challenge. So first thing is discovering change. And my advice would be today, just brief. I mean, take your time. Don't go too directly, too quickly in this change. And maybe take the time to ask yourself, so, okay, what is my first reaction with this change? Okay, I get it. And wait a few hours, a few days, come back and ask yourself again this question. How I'm going with this change? How is it, is it okay for me? And maybe the answer will be quite different. You will see an evolution, you know, from the first time you ask the question and the second time. So, yeah, I think that's the first thing. And before going to take a first step, I would like to speak about, you know, the head, body and heart approach. The head approach in the change for me is what is my idea? What is my ambition concerning this change? The heart approach would be what is my motivation, my desire going through this change? And third thing, body approach, what can I do? What actions could be aligned with these ideas and this ambition? So yes, second proposal is take a first step because action is always a good way to explore, you know, your positioning to change, uh, to set the course and to engage yourself. You know, I know something is it's, it's better to act rather than suffer. So I like that. It's better to go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first step. And after that, stay tuned to your needs. Um, it's so important to put you on priority. We will speak after uh, about this subject. Work on your self-care first. Feed your needs. You are so precious. You're central. You can see we have this central third point on the slide stay tuned to your needs so sarah what is coming next well it, i love the the analogy of the athlete because if we imagine ourselves as a top athlete and we're, we're running a very long race which sometimes navigating change can be there will be a time in this journey where we start to get tired where we lose that initial motivation so how are we going to remain positive and stay determined? Well, this is about really thinking about your goal, reminding yourself what that first step was, where you were trying to get to. And it's also about reviewing the progress that we've made, because sometimes when we stop for a moment, take a breath and look at where we've come from and how we've navigated so far it can give us that extra motivation to keep that positivity high and to really be determined. 
And of course, if we really want to embrace change, this is about doing it together, really, and planning for the success and doing it together as a team, because we are usually as strong as our weakest link. And when we share the successes, when we really look at how far we're coming and keeping that goal very firmly in our mindset, then we get there. And like those people that feel excitement when a change is about to happen, you too will start to feel like you can embrace change because you know that there's good things to come. So Valerie, are you going to give us a little snapshot of what we have covered in our five steps and how we navigate change? Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Christelle, for this great insights. So Marles, if I retain three things from what you've just talked to, talked to us, uh, the first one is resistance to change is just normal. But the good thing is that there are resources and tools that exist to better embrace it, embrace it. And change is a process, as we saw in the curve before. So now we've talked about that. We are going to talk about the skill sets and is particularly the key power skills that you can develop to better embrace change. And Christelle. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valérie. To you. Yeah. So today we wanted to share with you a meta-analyst from the Work Economic Forum, which is a reference. Uh, we wanted to share the skills concerned by the future of work. Uh, here we see a real evolution of key skills, you know, from 2020 to 2030. Uh, so in this part, we want to highlight the key competencies organizations are going to have a specific focus on uh, in building, you know, a uh, skills referential in order to develop the people. And at the same time, that's also a focus for each of us, because the question is, which are the skills I should start, you know, developing now and in the months to come? So to summarize, maybe three emerging uh, trends, we could say there is analytic, but a systemic, you know, thinking skills, uh, analyzing not only subject by subject, but realizing a global mapping, considering all the stakeholders, you know, the collective, as you said, Sarah, and understanding the interactions going through this collective is so essential today. And also the ability to learn, we can see that with active learning or learning strategies. So developing ourselves, learning to learn is another key, you know, to go for change. And finally, maybe I would say the ability to open up to one's environment, to open your mind to diverse profile, maybe, you know, neurodiverse profile, that which helps you uh, with judgment, decision making, resolution of complex problems. That's for me, you know, the link in this specific uh, corpus skills. So maybe let's dive now. Let's dive. Let's go dive. Little, yeah, a little bit more <laughs> in these power skills. And we can start with cognitive skills. So what key cognitive skills to help embrace change? So they are three we've decided to spotlight today. First one is cognitive flexibility, because as we talked before, our, our brain is made for change and we can definitely change our thinking, you know, to adapt to new and unexpected situation as well. The second one is the systemic, deductive and systemic analysis. So maybe we can ask ourselves, what is my role in this change? But what is the role of other people? Uh, what are the link, you know, between us in these interactions? What is, you know, making us a much closer, maybe? So you are not alone. As you said, Sarah, it's a collective trend to go and embrace change. And last one, it's the complex problem solving. So usually when you go for change, there are some problem solving, there are some complex situations that's important and that's a processor. So maybe you need a little bit recipe here. So for me, the focus points are, you know, maybe consider the rational and emotional information separately but consider both of them. Uh, speak to people different from you, you know, to consider different opinions. Identify as well your bias. Everybody has bias, so it's important to just make a step on that. And to summarize, I think the key is to develop your uh, critical thinking. You know, it's along, it's going along the process as well. So being more conscious about where you're coming from on those three 
cognitive skills. And what you, are, you have to develop as an individual and as a collective is, uh, I think, really important to start with. So, Sarah, what key interpersonal skills now can help navigate change as well? Well, it's great that we're talking so much about skills, isn't it? Because it's such a, a key turning point really for the, the workforce. We're really looking at what those skills are. So I'm going to be looking at the interpersonal skills here. And there's two key ones that we're looking at. The first is emotional intelligence and secondly, collective intelligence. So what we know about change, of course, is that the first part of that curve is so emotional. So how does emotional intelligence as a skill help us? Well, first of all, it gives us that moment of real self-awareness where you start to tap into yourself and think, what is it I'm feeling right now? How is this impacting my personal behaviors? And then if we think about how we can then regulate ourselves, we can then start to move through that change curve as we develop these skills. And if we're in leadership or we want to help our colleagues, this is then about helping others both become self-aware and be able to regulate and be able to understand and read what other people are feeling and have that moment of empathy so that we do become in it together which is really where collective intelligence comes to play its part as well. Because this is about starting to develop a generative dialogue. It's really about facilitating open conversations so that you can start to really empower each other to move and navigate difficulties together. By using collective intelligence, we can help people really see the light and understand that this is all a real part of the journey and that together we can break boundaries. And this really stems from being able to facilitate those conversations, finding those common ground between us so that we can navigate those barriers. But the skills don't end there, do they, Christelle? Yeah, it's so, it's so right, it's so important. So now we think we speak about self-development skills. It's so important for me, you know. Developing oneself is a prerequisite uh, for lifelong learning. So believe in yourself because it's possible to develop yourself whatever your age. I think it's important to say that. And develop as well your sense of agency, agency uh, which is the ability to act, you know, to affect the world, influencing the, influencing the environment. So the main point here is that we're talking about someone who makes things happen rather than someone whom things happen. So that's a big deal. I think now you, you see this paradigm shift we're talking uh, since the beginning. Um, the other point is a care dimension. Um, I would say, don't forget yourself. We know that as a majority, uh, we have a reflex to think and take, take care of all the people first and forget uh, oneself. But really, can you objectively believe that you are capable to help over and anyone if you are out of the game? Uh, I wanted to give you an example about, you know, the former prime minister, New Zealand prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, uh, who resigned, you know, in January 2023 to overcome an energy deficit. She was not in capacity anymore to take care of others because her energy was pumped out. So care is also, you know, a concept uh, used and spotlight really on sustainable leadership. It's like a virtuous cycle because you need to take care of yourself first, after to others next to you, and maybe last and finally, you know, at least to all the stakeholders around you. And going for positive and growth mindset, Sarah, we have seen how a positive attitude uh, to change uh, in search, very motivated for opportunities and new things you can you can know can make really the difference. But we will start, we will see that with you later on, Sarah. No. And I think yeah, teasing now. <laughs> and I think Valerie maybe would like to share with us now your perspective uh, concerning the skill set focus. Thank you. You've shared a lot of skills here and. 
But if there are three I would retain, the first one is first take a step back and analyze the situation. Then the second one I would remember is accept and embrace your emotions. And last but not least, develop a growth mindset. And we are going to talk about this among other resources and techniques that Sarah and Christel are going to share with us now. Thanks, Valerie. So yes, we're going to have a look at these here. And what we've got here is four approaches that you can use. So we're going to be talking about how you can get out of your comfort zone. And Christelle is going to show you the approach that you use to do that. I'll be talking about how you can really manage your energy levels with Christelle showing you how you can harness and experience that real flow of work and really experience true productivity. And I will be showing you the resource of how you can really adopt a growth mindset to enable you to work through embracing change. So Christelle, we will start with you and the comfort zone. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Sarah. So maybe I was thinking it's maybe a little bit more stepping, you know, out of your comfort zone, better than um, stretching, I mean, better than stepping. So you're going to jump, you're going to stretch little by little, you know, around all those zones. And I wanted to give a citation about Antoine Pellissolo, who is a French psychiatrist. He used to say, fear doesn't avert danger. I really like this because just, you know, with the images of surf we have from the beginning, with the image of that, you're just going, you know, to, to the sea and you are surfing for the first time with very, very big waves. And I mean, you can leave your fear on the beach. So take it with you. <laughs> so that's a main point. And like a yoga practitioner, you, you try, you go through all those zones, you, you go ahead, you come back home, at home, and the home is the comfort zone, and that's okay, here you're secure, and you can go outside again. So take benefit of that, just experiment that in your everyday life, that's okay, and that's, that's nice, that's healthy to go through, you know, all that, these zones. So yes, let's maybe practice. And if we go a little bit more precisely, if we want to be more specific concerning those four zones, first of all is identify your comfort zone. That consists in maybe searching for experiences you are proud of, uh, the habits, the expertise you are comfortable with, the refuge activities which help you uh, charge and recharge your battery. And second one, you're going to accept, you know, little by little to touch, to step in this panic zone. So maybe here you need to identify your doubts, your emotions, as we said before, Sarah, your fear. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, funded or unfunded fears, whatever. And uh, that's a process. Maybe you will have some automatic thoughts, just like, I'm not going to make it. We're all going, you know, straight into the wall. But that's okay to have those thoughts. So be kind, be kind with you. Uh, that's all right. And when it's too much, you go back to the comfort zone. And after that, you can go under step three. You can't during the learning zone. I think this zone allows you to replace fear with knowledge. Okay, so change has always been, will always be an opportunity for you. So imagine the small steps that will enrich you that will opening you up to a wider world. And it's really close to reach your magic zone because projecting success, visualize how it will look like, how you will feel, how you will feel when you will reach this objective. It's so precious. It's also considering uh, new activities, new opportunities, new challenges. That's so powerful and it helps, I think, embracing change with motivation. I think you, you spoke about that before, Sarah, the motivation that is key. So, Sarah, would you share with us now some insight about energy? Because I know that you like so much this concept. I'm so <laughs> eager to hear from you. <laughs> I do. And, and if we think about change and we, what the things we've already talked about, all those emotions can really drain our energy. If we think about what you just talked about, Christelle, and that stretching, yeah. 
it takes a lot of our energy. So a great resource for us here is learning how to manage our energy really effectively. And we're going to look at these four dimensions here of energy. But before I do that, I want to open it out to all of you. And I want you to imagine um, a real a family celebration, a big celebration. So for me, the one I'm thinking of is, is Christmas Day. We, we're here with 27 different countries on this webinar with us. So maybe you can think of your own family celebrations where you have lots of your favorite foods. Just consider, how do you feel after that huge meal? Has it left you feeling energized? Or do you feel in a slump? Christelle, how do you feel after that huge meal? Because uh, I know that I'm yeah, on I, Yeah, I feel like I, I will be sleeping, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with you. I need a rest. So quite often, some of the things that we think fill us with energy are the opposite. So let's have a look at these in the, each of their boxes here. So first of all, that physical element. Are you filling yourselves with good, nutritious food that's going to give you energy? Are you considering your sleep? Are you considering exercise and, and having those breaks? If we think about a time of change, which is so emotional and so busy in the workplace, actually getting out for a walk or, or doing those things that give us energy, sometimes they're the things that we let drop. And understanding that this, that these elements will help us have more energy is really powerful. So let's move to emotional. What fills up your emotional cup? So for me, it's people. People really fill my emotional cup and they give me more energy. Yet when I'm feeling stressed or tired in a time of change, that's the bit that I think I haven't got time for and I push it away. So it's about learning to understand that if we can fill our emotional energy, we get more energy. For me, being with people fills that up and it will be different for everybody. And there's some examples here on the screen. It might be an element of self-control, really starting to embrace positive emotions. And that brings me on to spiritual, those things that give you joy or peace in your soul. I know Christelle and I, we, we'd like a little bit of meditation because of work that we've done previously. And we know that that time is very well spent. Spiritual for me is about me being in the place where I feel most like myself. And for me, that's a muddy field with lots of horses and animals around me. But by making time for that, it means that in a busy environment and a changing environment, I am more able to cope because it's given me energy. And I would love you to be putting your examples in the chat. As I'm talking now, think about the things that give you energy. And the last one here, which I'm going to talk about is mental energy and being able to focus and concentrate. And one of the things that Christelle is going to talk about in a moment is, is another resource that we can use. And it's the resource of productivity. So how are you enabling yourself to concentrate? How are you enabling yourself to be productive? What we know is, is that the more productive a person feels, the more open somebody is to learning new things, the more positive impact it has on our energy. Now, that all sounds lovely, but actually we have to develop that. It doesn't just happen because we've looked at a nice slide on a screen. We have to develop this into habits and rituals. It starts with, first of all, being really aware of our energy, what drains it, what can lift it. And as we practice and we build new rituals, they start to grow. It starts with that first drop that you can see on, on the screen here. And then they ripple out, getting bigger. And before you know it, if you keep practicing, then you have a better handle on your energy because it started to develop into a, hab a habit that's gone through the process of neuroplasticity. It's now fully embedded in your unconscious mindset so that you are doing it automatically, which is a great place to be. 
Now, another great place to be and another resource that we can use is over to Christelle, who's going to talk about flow and that productivity, which so links to the mental side of it, doesn't it, Christelle? Yeah, that's such an interesting concept, you know, flow. Sometimes during periods of change, we get caught up in a sort of stressful rhythm, as you say, Sarah, that drains our energy, can even lead to burnout. So that's essential to identify some missions you can freely exercise, your talents, uh, your skills with ease, fluidity, and setups of moments you know, of recuperation. So flow is really a state, a psychological state, reached by a person when she's completely you know, immersed in an activity. And she will find a maximum state of concentration, full engagement, and satisfaction as well. What is really interesting, you know, with this concept is that this feeling of gratification of pleasure is even more intense when doing the task and not only by achieving the task. So it's during the exercise, the doing things that it really come out. And I wanted to show you, I read, I read on social media a few days ago, the example of a young uh, and really successful entrepreneur who has she passed, she passed the million euro, you know, markup in sales. That's quite significant. She suffered at this moment of a burnout because she was realizing that she had overwhelmed herself with, by, you know, thankless tasks she didn't like. And she didn't take the time for pleasure things she, she really liked. So it was draining her energy. So really capitalizing on things you like and the flow experience will really enable you to Go forward, go forward for change with motivation, desire, and I was I was seeing a psychological freedom somewhere. So I think um, as well, we wanted to share with you counseling flow. You know the benefits. You can discover a few of them because benefits are so huge with the flow, and for me, it's a perfect antidote against against mental or cognitive overload. As coach, I think you agree, Sarah, we usually, you know, I speak about meditation, yoga, mm -hmm. breathing and so on. And sometimes we are not using, you know, this incredible, you know, concept of flow. So let's use it more and more. It's really contributing to this stage of, you know, agency I was speaking about. For me, it's we are doing things, we decide to do things that we like. And that's such a benefit for each of us to think like this. And at this stage, I'm sure you're telling yourself, okay, that's so nice, this concept. I like it so much. <laughs> but how can I do that, you know, uh, in my home? So I would give you a little piece of advice, three advices. Maybe first create, you know, a nice environment, an inspiring workplace when you can put some nice pictures or you can add elements of, such as plan, for example, to feel good. The second one would be uh, establish rituals and rituals. Also, you, you spoke about that concerning energy. You have to maybe it's listening to music. It's doing some breathing, a short meditation before starting the task you want to, to, to do. And uh, last one, maybe it could be find the right moment. I think it's about to find your moment, maybe in the morning, in the afternoon, late afternoon, whatever. Find the moment right for you. So that was a little bit piece of advice I wanted to share with you. But I think, Sarah, now it's time for you to dive in another grateful and powerful concept with growth mindsets. It is, absolutely. And this is something that I use with my children a lot, to be fair. And this is research that's been done by Carol Dweck. You might have heard about this. And it really focuses around the word yet. And I'm going to give you an example. I can't do it yet. Carol Dweck's research really focuses and, and it's been worked on students whereby she's analyzed students who have that real sense of perfectionism, that I need to do it now. And that compared to the embracing of new challenges and thinking, I can't do it yet, how much more that enables people to grow. And it really does go back to that neuroscience that Christelle and I keep talking about because it's so important. But the brain is designed to learn. The, desert, the brain is designed to learn through mistakes. If we think about when we were a baby and we fell over and then we got up and now we can walk, we've learned through that. We just weren't able to walk 
yet. So when we use the power of yet, we start to embrace new challenges. And this is really important in times of change because it allows us to make those mistakes. It allows us to look for new solutions and really think about what opportunities are there in in front of us. And it's okay not to be there yet because we know that we are going to get there. It opens up our minds for these new things. So what can we do in organizations if we're really going to harness the tool of a growth mindset? Well, if you are working with other people, if you're in a leadership role, you can start to offer more intelligent praise. And what I mean by that is, is not it's not about recognizing intelligence or the outcome. It's about recognizing the effort. So saying, I really liked how you worked through that. I like how you didn't give up. So recognizing the process, enjoying the journey, because when we're able to do that, we're much more likely to get there. And that yet does become our reality. The thing is, then we keep moving the goalposts because then we grow and grow and grow and become brilliant. And it's about being able to look at the silver lining that the clouds have brought because every challenge, and there's some examples on the screen here, allow you to become better, allow your teams to become better, really allow you to embrace the change. And I'm going to be telling a little story in a moment, but when we start to look at how we can flip challenges into opportunities, we create new things. And there's just some examples here. You know, if we think about the things that can get in front of us when we're going through big changes, if we just think about that concerns about the future, let's just think about what we could achieve. Could be things like better team functioning, more innovation, learning new skills, building new relationships. If we just take COVID for an example, there were so many, so many bad things that came out of it, but there was also some good things. We learn a lot about ourselves as well in that time. So there's lots of things that we can learn. There's lots of tools and resources that are available to us. And that's available to us as organizations, as leaders. But sometimes in this, sometimes the individuals need to have the resources and tools to be able to learn for themselves and be able to learn and grow. And Christelle, I know that you've been working on a really special project that is going to enable individuals to do just that. Right. Thank you, Sarah. I like the way you're telling about, you know, reframe. We're speaking about that together, how we reframe our vision as well. Yeah. So, yes, in order to dive, you know, deeper and deeper in, the, in these processes of change, we've worked through two programs in Segos. And it's another tool. Maybe it's a gift for yourself and for your teams as well. The first, first one is an interactive video series. Uh, which is called My Story. So embrace the thematic is embrace change. And it, you will find 10 episodes uh, in which Mary, you see on the screen, is going for a change because she's asked to extend her position in the marketing field with new missions around digital stuff. Yes, I know. That's a weird subject. So we, you have the opportunity to observe. Observe is so interesting to learn as well. So we're going to observe Mary and see how she's going through, you know, uh, obstacle challenges, but for the best, how she's uh, getting, you know, with all these emotions, uh, the kind of recipe, the method she's going to put in place. So that's such so interesting. And the second program is a two day course uh, format. Uh, so you, you have time. You have time to, uh, you know, uh, understand the theory, experiment, also practice a lot with your peers in this format. So it's another way, you know, of going in this subject, but also very efficient. So what's coming next? When I say that, maybe we can share with you how we can help teams as well embracing change. And I think, Sarah, you wanted to share with us um, an experience you had 
Yeah, I, I'm really privileged to be able to work with lots of companies as they undergo and go through changes. And I was commissioned to work with a, a large organization and really deal and work with the top layers of leadership here. And what was really apparent was that um, being able to that to be their authentic self um, was quite a new concept for them. And this would be a real top tip for you all, because what these leaders were struggling with was they wanted to be strong. And what they really learned was that collective intelligence, uh, being able to share their stories of challenge into opportunity actually started to help their people. So to give you an example of that, when they realized that they could say to their teams of a time where they had been very worried in a terrible state of change, where they saw the future as being really quite bleak, when they look back on it and saw the opportunities that came from that, that by sharing those stories with their teams, their team started to relate to them as human beings. They were able to be their authentic selves. But then the other thing that came from that was collective intelligence, that between them, they came stronger as a team and they were able to move together, really starting to break down some of those barriers that had been in front of them. And this is a great example of opening yourself up. They were able to use growth mindset with a little bit of help and they were able to embrace going forward within collective intelligence so a great example of how it really can work effectively when we use the tools that are there to help us and what about you christelle I can share with you, Sarah, you know, company, French big company, they were going through a reorganization and they have to say goodbye to some salaries. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a big change for all the companies. Oh. It's human, you know, human change. Yeah. And they decided to uh, propose. So the theory uh, I was speaking about my story uh, to the salaries in two objectives. First, you know, for the, the people who are leaving the company, just to see this challenge is an opportunity for you to discover maybe new activities, mm -hmm. new people in another company, and maybe for some of them, you know, uh, become their own uh, boss and be an entrepreneur. It was also maybe for some of them a real opportunity, you know. And mm -hmm. for people who were staying, it was also an opportunity to say, okay, the story, that's another step of the story of the company I'm working with. And maybe I can embrace this change and be very also motivated to see what's gonna happen, how I'm going to be a part of this new challenge, new new change of the history of the company. So I thought it was so interesting, you know, uh, like a decision yeah. to do that for the, for the company and the salaries and the teams. It's inspiring, isn't it, to hear these stories and know the difference that can be made when it's when the, the, the tools are being used. It's, it's fantastic, right. it really is. Right. Valerie, I think you're going to wrap us up, aren't you? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we're coming to the end of this webinar. Thank you very much for those insightful resources, the skills that you shared today. And so if of the whole webinar, if there are three things that I would retain and that would, I would invite you to take with you, three key messages among all the others that were shared, because everything could be just remembered. <laughs> the first one is that change is inevitable. It just happens all the time. It's all around us. We just can't prevent facing change. And reaction to change is just human. And change can always be an opportunity. And you've just shared two examples. And before you talked about growth mindsets and other things of how we can all see it as an opportunity or help our, our teams, our employees also see it as an opportunity and making it an opportunity. Um, so now, if uh, we can go to well, if you have any questions, we have a few comments in the chat. And so Christelle and, uh, and Sarah are going to look at it. But if you have any more questions you would like to ask, comments to make, they're all welcome. So don't hesitate to add any more. Yeah, I would love to come in here and talk about some of the comments that have come. Yeah, through. yeah, please, yeah. please. Yeah. Uh, because you were you were very inspired by the use of energy looking yeah. at it here. And I can see that Sonia and Isabel here feel really energized when they 
they walk by the sea. And I think there's something very powerful about the sea. I, I used to live by the sea and I miss it greatly because it's such a big energy in itself. But by recognizing that going out for that walk, um, being in nature, which quite a few of you have said, it yeah. really does give you that additional energy, which is just beautiful. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah. Florenza, Fiorenza here says about love giving energy and uh, a, an unexpected thank you. You know, and that's so easy to do, isn't it, Christelle? In, in yeah. the workplace and at home and everywhere, just by really appreciating people around us, it can have such a positive impact. Yeah, it's a sense of gratitude, you know. Be, be grateful for what we're living, for the people we're working with. Sometimes we, we forgot that. That's, that's so essential. And yeah. I love also, I love Laura said, I love rituals so much. Yeah. And rituals, that's just, you know, a way to have a sort of anchor, you know, to be very well organized. And that's a way also to find time in your agenda, which is so, so full. But with rituals, just say, okay, I'm going to, to take a time for myself here. And I think that's, that's a start of something very interesting as well. Yeah, and it, and it is, it takes the practice to become, to do those rituals, but they're so beneficial. And I love what you've just said, Christelle, about it being an anchor, because it really does anchor you back in this sea of chaos. And just coming over to Pedro. So Pedro says, change is a constant challenge. And actually, Pedro, you're right. Change is pretty much guaranteed. Okay, nothing, nothing <laughs> is going to be the same. So by using some of the, the tools and really starting to develop the skills that enable us to navigate and embrace change can really help. I've also got to come over to Jose here, who's talking about riding the motorcycle. As yeah. somebody that, that likes horse riding and being out in nature and having the, the breeze in my hair, it really does clear away all the cognitive debris of the day and it does give you energy, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes you don't feel like doing it, even though you know that it's the best thing for you. So yeah. remembering and developing it as a ritual. And you know what, Sarah, as well, you know, be conscious of you're doing it because sometimes we do things, we're doing it, doing it. we're taking care mm -hmm. of ourselves, but we're not completely conscious of that. So yeah. put some conscious on what we're doing. It's also another way, you know, to, to, to be to go through serenity, I think. And I love also Anne-Francois saying, I love reading poems because mm -hmm. we were speaking about the spiritual energy or mental energy. Sometimes it's more uh, complicated to understand this concept. And reading some poesy, some poems is also a way to be in a kind of spiritual, mental posture uh, and, and, and kind of anchor again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, coming over to Samuela here, who is, is told a little story in the chat here about important changes that's happened in, in their company. And actually, yes, they're saying that the, the soft skills are really help. Um, I like to think of them as power skills, OK, because it, it makes such a difference. And you're absolutely right. It can be difficult to help people navigate from the shock, denial, from the, the negative side of the curve over to acceptance and forgiveness. But what's lovely about Samuela's story is that you are now facing growth and ready for future challenges and changes. And I'd love to know, pop in the chat, what made the difference? What did you do to get stakeholders through that curve? Um, because it's really interesting for everyone that's on, on the session with us here today. We agree. And coming over to Laura here saying, children know, young people know how to change. They absolutely yeah. do. They're in there such a state of learning, aren't they? And we've got to learn from them to remember that we're, we're, never, we're never too old to learn. We should all, you know, a lifelong a life of continuous learning really is where we should be going and particularly in the workplace i think and i also you know the cultural taking care of others you know this culture of taking care of others as as taking care of ourselves should be a natural reflex so that's a paradigm shift you have to change our mindset uh, our thinking around that uh, that's just beliefs so we were able to change that yeah uh 
Thank you, Christelle. Uh, there's a, a question come in here about growth mindset that I want to address here. Um, yeah. asking, how do you think people can use this as a concept, um, as a tool to improve tasks at work? This really starts from this is about building a culture of growth mindset. Um, this is about allowing people to make mistakes. So looking at the culture of a company, uh, looking at yourself if you're a leader, um, looking at how you interact with other people. If we use things such as coaching to coach people through mistakes that have made, to enable people to work through the journey of challenge, that can improve tasks um, as we work. Uh, a conversation that I had with with a, an entrepreneur at a conference not so long ago was that when they started as a startup, they started their culture very much of make mistakes, learn fast, learn hard, because by actually embracing the challenge, embracing the journey means that we can move through um, innovation very, very quickly. It, it's about start. It starts with you and how, how you work with yourself, how you feel up in your own growth mindset, and then bringing that through to stakeholders and creating a team environment where it's okay to learn and enjoy the journey. And then the bigger piece of an organizational culture. And, and like I said, praise the journey, praise the effort, praise the resilience rather than intelligence and outcomes. I hope that that's helped answer your question there. And just experiment, you know, Sarah, do it again. Yes, do that's it the word, again. experiment. Yeah, but do it again. Yeah. Start again. Yeah. You need yeah. to play golf, tennis, whatever. You need to practice, practice, practice. So yeah. That's exactly the same kind of thing in the professional life. Yeah. So and we reflection. Can do yeah. Reflection. So yeah. certainly I know that after this, we'll have a debriefing and say, you know, what could we have done differently? What, what could we do to make it better? And that's okay. And it's also about accepting feedback as well, isn't it? And saying, you know, what can I have done differently? All of those things will help. We have another question here, which is interesting, from Jan Moreau. Uh, my question is, who is in charge to guarantee team collaboration and intelligence? So who can take this one on? It's nearly at the end. You know, I would say everyone, everyone, everybody for me is in charge of that, you know? Intel, as you say, collective intelligence is each people who is doing, you know, the effort of speaking to other people. Of course, you always have leaders in organization, people who are at ease with speaking, interacting. So they are very catalyzer of that. But I think if we speak about responsibility, Sarah, I think it's the responsibility of each person in the company to really share that very strongly with one another. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Paul here is saying about psychological safety and how psychological safety is vital for growth mindset. I couldn't agree with you more, Paul. It's about creating that safe environment. So people know it's OK to, to learn and grow and make mistakes. We're human beings. We're not technology and technology doesn't always work either. So, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, definitely make it a safe environment. And again, that starts with each of you as an individual. Uh, where there's no fear of judgment. Hmm. Well, I thank think, you. Yeah. A great thank you to Christelle, to Sarah, and to all of you for your questions, comments, and for following this webinar to the end. Um, thank you for participating. And should you wish to stay in contact with us, you can either go to the seagulls.com website, or we have shared here with you the uh, QR code to the LinkedIn profiles of Sarah and uh, Christelle so that you can follow the conversation in another way and using this social network. Thank you, everybody. You will receive the replay a few minutes after the webinar, and the slides will be available for download within the WebIQ platform. And it was great to have you all with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.